In this video I'd like to show you the new generation hobbies power supply unit for the Lawmate 500 milliwatt video transmitter series. This video transmitter comes in 2.4 gigahertz and 1.2 gigahertz. It's very popular with some very accomplished pilots. It's fairly reliable, runs on 5 volts, which is advantageous because it will always have a good step down from anything from two cell lipos up, but the drawback is it's very sensitive to ripple current and switching noise from any switching power supply unit such as a switching BEC like this. Switching noise is the very rapid variation in voltage produced by any switching power supply that has a transistor that switches on and off from 10 to hundreds of thousands of times per second and that creates slight variations in the current supplied to the video transmitter and other downstream components. Most of these are built in with a ferrite toroid core like this which helps to reduce that switching noise somewhat but there's always some transmitted through to the power um, load. This can be mitigated sometimes by installing another ferrite like this and or a capacitor to smooth the voltage or an LC filter which includes both a capacitor and a choke. But I found that none of these solutions are adequate to provide the nice clean power that is required by the Lawmate 500 milliwatt transmitter. The new generation Hobbies PSU is in fact a switching power supply but it has an onboard capacitor and choke that all work in harmony to one another to provide a reliable smooth power output whereas mixing and matching other components you're never really quite sure what you're going to get as far as providing power to your transmitter. For 19 US dollars the new generation Hobbies PSU comes with the printed circuit board a connecting cable, which you'll need to solder on here, a shrink wrap for encasing the power supply unit and, if you desire, the video transmitter into one unit, like this, and a small plastic shim. The PSU is under 5 grams in weight and is about an inch square and is virtually identical to the dimensions of the Lawmate transmitter itself. It does have a small access for the uh, dip switches if you're in a country where it is legal to change the frequencies. This product comes with probably some of the best written instructions that I've ever seen for any product, even more so RC, and gives a step-by-step -step with pictures, so please refer to that before proceeding. The one absolutely necessary step will be to solder this connecting wire to the printed circuit board of the power supply unit at these four pad contacts. This is pretty small, it, although it is on the edge and can be accomplished with a smallish range 12 to 25 watt soldering iron with a very fine tip. In the default configuration, this cable need only bridge from these solder pads to this socket, which is only about a centimeter or two, well under an inch. But consider other factors in your mounting of your transmitter before you proceed. You may wish to provide these pins access from the side or the top or even locate this slightly remotely from the transmitter itself. So this will govern the length of your cable. The most important thing to note at first is these cable end modules are different from one another so don't just estimate your length and chop it off. Be certain to plug in the wire first so that you know is the correct one to cut and then you can determine how much of this length. My preferred installation of the video transmitter and the power supply unit is to use a rigid piece of metal or plastic like this and install the transmitter on one side and the power supply unit on the other side. This allows me to use two-sided foam tape to rigidly attach this but to maintain or access each of the components individually rather than sandwich the power supply unit between the mount and the transmitter. If your installation allows a pigtail or extension of your antenna you may consider mounting the transmitter and the power supply unit as one unitary piece and then stash that in your wing or your fuselage somewhere. Due to that design consideration, I'm going to assume that these pens may need to be accessed from any of the four directions here, with the worst case scenario being up and the solder pads being on the opposite corner. For each of the operations on this very thin gauge wire, I recommend a bypass type cutting instrument such as these wire cutters or even some scissors. Side cut and end cut cutters like this tend to 
splay out the strands and the solder if you have pre-tinned it, whereas a bypass type cutter will give nice clean square ends. Whether you've chosen the short or the long version of these leads, you'll need to expose the conductors inside for a very short length in order to solder onto the printed circuit board edge here. The instructions recommend against using strippers to avoid deforming the conductors and avoid cutting any of them because there are not many conductors in there. We want to preserve all of them. They recommend using a cigarette lighter just to melt this back with a sufficiently hot soldering iron particularly if you can directly contact the metal you'll notice that the insulation will burn back just enough to expose the conductors. Next apply some liquid flux to the tips of each of these contacts and use a high quality solder to tin the tips of the, each of these leaving exposed about three millimeters of conductor inside. Now that the tips are tinned we'll trim them back one final time so you get a nice square clean pre-tinned wire in preparation for soldering to the printed circuit board here. The circuit board comes with pre-tinned pads for soldering to the printed circuit board itself and there's a perfect amount of solder if you pre-tinned your conductor as well that all that needs to be done is to hold the conductor to the pad and gently apply heat directly to it until it melts together and no more. The order of the conductors from the pin side of the power supply unit is video audio, ground, and power. Even if you don't intend to use audio, go ahead and solder it on anyway as it provides an additional strain relief. Also be careful not to apply excessive amounts of solder that could wick down the conductor here and make a stiff region of the wire. That's an excellent break point. Rather try to limit the solder right to where it contacts the printed circuit board, allowing a more supple, movable contact here. In any case, this should be ultimately installed with a tension-free configuration so that there is no stress applied to the solder pads after installation. With delicate use of the soldering iron, you'll get all four contacts soldered on. Be sure you can see a little bit of red printed circuit board between each of your solder joints to ensure that there's no shorting between each of these. You also have the choice of designating the power pass-through to your camera here. This is a 12-volt camera and that can be accomplished by soldering across these two pads here is indicated 12 volts so the center to the upper pad here if your camera were 5 volts it can share the smooth power produced by the power supply unit here and you would simply bridge these two pads with a soldering iron just to melt that little bead of solder together if you do wish to mount your power supply unit directly onto the back of the transmitter place this small plastic shim over those resistors with a piece of two-sided tape or a tiny dab of glue be cautious that these pins on the back of the print circuit board are exposed and could potentially short out on the back of the transmitter. So you can choose to have it hang off a little bit or put some insulative material like a hot glue or some foam tape between the transmitter housing and the printed circuit board. The alternative I've chosen is to leave these actually separate, which will allow me to mount this in, in a variety of different configurations as needed given the airplane. I will place a dab of hot glue here over these contacts and squish it down to act as a strain relief for these. Here are the final connections in its raw form. On the upper three pins you'll see the power in which can be anywhere from 12 to 23 volts and the first and third pins are ground so this can actually be inserted in either direction. On these four pins from the top is ground power out to the camera if you've bridged that pad and the video signal this will be the audio signal which I'm not using in this case this goes to a GoPro lead but the exact same configuration would apply with this 12 volt camera which terminates in the familiar servo connector 